Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, especially all of our core residents who I know we're rushing here from uh, working so hard in the wards. Um, today, it is our goal to reach beyond the walls, the walls of Choni and highlight the importance of community engagement and community empowerment. Uh, we often meet families at really vulnerable times, and it's really our responsibility to make sure our institution uh, is attuned to the needs of our patients. With that, we're going to introduce our featured speaker for the day. We are so grateful to have Dr. Olajide Williams here with us today. Dr. Williams obtained his medical degree from the University of Lagos, Nigeria, and a master's degree from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health here in New York City, right here. Um, he is currently a tenured professor at Columbia um, with the Department of Neurology. He is also the Vice Dean of Community Health at the Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons here at Columbia, and the Senior Vice Chair of Neurology here as well. Dr. Williams is a global leader in race ethnic stroke disparities, co-chair of the Anti-Racism Task Force, co-director of the Columbia Center for Community Health, which houses a community health worker training center, and principal investigator of multiple NIH health disparities focused research awards, including several large randomized cl clinical tri trials. Dr. Williams has authored numerous peer-reviewed articles. He has also received many prestigious awards, including a World Health Organization Health Champion Award, a European Stroke Research Foundation Investigator of the Year Award, Columbia University Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award, National Humanism and Medicine Award from the AAMC, National Medical Association Lewis Stokes Health Advocacy Award, American Health Association Trailblazer Award, Fast Company 100 Most Creative People in Business List, and the New York Academy of Medicine's Rising Leader Award. He is an elected member of the Association of American Physicians and has been featured multiple times on your magazine's best doctors lists. Along with hip hop pioneer, Dougie Fresh, he is co-founder and president of Hip Hop Public Health, an award-winning internationally recognized New York-based nonprofit organization that leverages hip hop, music, art, and science to promote health literacy and healthy behaviors in, com in communities of color. We are so excited to have you joining us today. Welcome, Dr. Williams. So it's, a, it's such an honor to be here today. Um, I have to say, whenever I get a call from Marina, um, who am I to, to decline? So I never say no to Marina when she asks me to do things. Um, and you are all better off having her in your department. She's a, a true source of inspiration to me too. Um, this is a huge honor. Um, it's a huge honor to be here. Uh, to be your featured speaker at this really important time uh, in our history, uh, where I'm, it is my opinion uh, and the opinion of many in this country that diversity is and DEI initiatives are under significant assault um, from many segments of this country. So it's critically important for us to double down on our efforts to make sure that we don't leave folks behind. How do I forward this? How do I forward this link? Just oh, thank you. There we go. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so these are my dis disclosures. These are my active grants, and I'm very grateful for the uh, for the NIH and a lot of my collaborators in this work. So um, so why, I want to begin with this slide, um, White Coat, a Black Physician Scientist in America. And, and you'll understand why I began with this slide because it's, it, it's not easy for uh, scientists of color uh, in this country and, and hopefully you'll see why. So this is something everyone should know about. It was called the Flexner Report uh, Alexander Flexner was asked to read, look, look, look critically at medical education, and, and a lot of really good things came out of this report um, in terms of standardizing and structuring a medical education in this country. But the report also led to the closure of five out of the seven medical schools uh, dedicated to training Black medical students, um, and, and this was really uh, due to the lack of resources uh, and philanthropic backing necessary 
to implement the standards of the report. And, and these lack of the lack of resources, uh, lack of philanthropic backing was really driven at the time by structural racism. However, two uh, medical schools, uh, you know, survived the cuts, uh, and they're still one of the most eminent uh, uh, medical schools in this country for for in terms of producing black physicians, and that is Howard University uh, and Menhari Medical College. But the decline in 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 black doctors as a result of of this report was really devastating. Um, but there was also a decline in the number of women doctors that were produced as a result of the Flexner report. A recent study actually looked at, um, um, at what would have happened um, had those five medical, those five schools closed by Flexner remained open. And it, they estimated that it would have produced a 29% increase in the number of graduating African-American physicians in 2019 alone. What we see, and you can look at the pie chart on the left, is that currently there are about 5% 5, 5 of the physician population um, is African-American in this country. Uh, about 5.8% are Hispanic. And, um, and what we have not seen, um, what we've also seen is a trickle um, over the last 120 years, 4% increase in these numbers over the last 20 years, which really hasn't kept up with population growth even though they were beginning from a lower place. Now, if you look at um, the number of NIH principal investigators on research program grants, you can see that um, for African-Americans, th there are only 1.1%. This is a 2010 data. Uh, actually, I always say that this is one of the, 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 the times that it's actually not good to be part of the 1% in this country. Um, and, and if you look at the Hispanic data, um, about 3.5% of NIH investigators um, were, were, were Hispanic PIs. Um, I compare this to uh, the other numbers, 71% uh, white, 16.4% um, Asian. Uh, if you look at the census at the time of this, of this data, uh, you can see that at that time, you know, the white data pretty much matched the, the overarching census. Uh, the African American data relative to the 12.6% in the census was abysmally low. Uh, Hispanic data was also abysmally low. Um, the Asian data actually out, out, out overperformed relative to the US census. Uh, and so these were really concerning data at the NIH at the time. And there were a bunch of initiatives that were launched around 2010 uh, to really address some of these issues. If you look at the probability of, of NIH R01 award by race ethnicity, um, and you can see the, the graph here, the chart here, um, the, you can see the, in the blue, which represents African-American applicants, they're about 13.2% uh, point, percentage points less likely than white applicants to, uh, to uh, get, get an R01. And even if you control for you know, typical things like education background, previous research awards, publication record, uh, black applicants still remain 10% less likely than whites to be awarded NIH funding. Interestingly, there was no significant funding gap for applications from Hispanic scientists or from women at that time. And so they looked into the reasons why, you know, what are the underlying reasons for this funding gap? And, um, you know, a follow-up study analyzed six stages of the application process from 2011 to 2015, and they found that the disparate outcomes arise from three of the six uh, stages. First was decision to discuss. The second was impact score assignment. And, and the third, which is a previously unstudied stage, was topic choice. And what they found that among African-American applicants, that they, they found that African-American applicants tended, tended to propose research on topics with lower award rates. The most common of such topics was at the community level, as opposed to more fundamental mechanistic uh, topics uh, and investigations, the latter which tended to have much higher award rates. Uh, in fact, this topic choice alone uh, accounted for over 20% of the funding gap 
after controlling for multiple variables, including the applicant's prior achievements. And so there was a New York Times article that, that followed this, and there was, there was, a, there was a, a lot of discussion in academic circles about uh, the valuing of different types of research and how they're all weighted within study sections. Uh, and the NIH um, uh, really looked at this and took it very seriously and put together several initiatives to try to close these gaps. And so as far as the NINDS uh, uh, funding landscape, which is the institute that I apply to for a lot of my grants, there was at the time when I started my career, major bias towards basic science that I've, I've just reported and also epidemiological studies. You know, major academic institutions tend to follow the money. Uh, in other words, they really follow those RFPs that are put out by the NIH. And if there are only a smidge of RFPs dedicated towards community relative to uh, large numbers of RFPs dedicated to other types of science, and those other types of endeavors will prevail. And community level interventions were less likely to be funded. Um, in fact, at the time that I started this work, there are only uh, three PIs that were funded to do community level interventions at the NINDS. And this has significant implications for career trajectory. Um, you can be discouraged from following your passion uh, if you know that there is not much of an academic trajectory in following your passion. And you might decide to compromise your, 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 your passion for other areas that you think are more likely to lead to promotion. And so I'll just begin by launching straight into the research that I did. So I was at Harlem Hospital at the time. Um, and there's just a basic clinical observation at the bedside where too many of our patients were arriving uh, you know, way beyond the three hours at the time, now four and a half hour window. And a disproportionate number of stroke patients that we were seeing at Harlem Hospital were, in, were within their 40s. Um, and this was consistent with a lot of uh, disparities data uh, showing that the highest black white disparities in stroke incidence and mortality um, occurred at the younger ages. If you look at the chart and you look at the hazard ratios, you can see that they decline as you get older. Uh, at 85, the, it, it completely attenuates, and that's likely an artifact of survival. If you go backwards into younger ages, by the time you reach the age of 35 to 45, those mortality ratios are really close to four, which is really quite devastating. But presenting data without context is a problem. Um, and, and we must never present charts with disparity data without providing the context for these disparities. Data has shown that doing that leads to uh, biased hypotheses that tend to be tilted towards biological explanations as opposed to social explanations. It can lead to biased policies and procedures, and it can direct funding into areas that are really not going to reveal the true underlying drivers of these disparities. And what is the context for African Americans in this country? Well, it goes back to slavery. Um, and it goes back to those structures that were created uh, back in 1619 to preserve and maintain white supremacy and normalize black inferiority among the population so that racism would be accepted as a social norm. And imagine 400 years of normalizing black inferiority, what that does to society, even after independence, even after the Emancipation Proclamation, those structures were simply morphed from what they called slave codes at the time to what were now refer referred to as black codes. And those black codes were used to maintain white privilege because the prevailing wisdom at the time with black inferiority was a real concept and we need structures to preserve white privilege. Fast forward to the period of reconstruction in this country when the Jim Crow, Crow laws were were born, very harsh, discriminating laws that led to segregation, redlining, that targeted Black people, and that in turn led to marginalization of whole communities and concentration of poverty within those communities. And that concentration of poverty is what really gave, gave rise to what we refer to as adverse social determinants of health, poor access to capital, poorly funded schools, poor housing conditions and physical environment, poor access to health care. And we now know that 60% of our health is determined by our zip code. 60% of our health is driven by these social 
determinants of health. And the regards group uh, in Birmingham, they looked at about 27,000 of their participants, and it's a huge epidemiological stroke study that follows uh, residents longitudinally. Uh, and they looked at the role of social determinants of health um, you know, as uh, you know, in in and its relationship with incident stroke, and they found that, you know, if those who had three or more SDOHs, and you can see in the chart, you know, ranging from low education to low household income to zip code poverty, et cetera, they had, you know, even after adjusting for all the usual suspect, those individuals were still fifty percent had fifty percent higher stroke risk uh, than those without. Uh, adverse social determinants of health. And so one of those social, one of those adverse social determinants of health is low educational attainment. And we know the role of structural racism uh, in creating low educational attainment for certain groups versus other groups. And one of the things that my work is focused on is health literacy and related behaviors. Uh, because health literacy interventions has been shown, and this was uh, some work that I'm uh, that was was commissioned by the National Academy of Medicine. We know that health literacy interventions and, and can truly reduce uh, health disparities or contribute to the reduction in health disparities, which in turn fosters health equity. Uh, but the relationship between educational attainment uh, and health outcomes is a complex relationship that goes beyond health literacy alone. But I wanted to focus on health literacy. For me, it was a low-hanging fruit. Um, and if we want to define health literacy, it's the ability to obtain, understand, and act on health information. It's highest among people from undeserved communities. Uh, we know that it decreases the use of up, the uses of other preventable, preventative services, increases emergency visits, hospitalizations, readmissions, delayed care-seeking decisions specifically for stroke. Um, increased medication errors, increases the risk of death by up to 54%, higher healthcare expenditures, increases vulnerability misinformation and disinformation. This is just a short list of the relationship between health literacy, low health literacy, uh, and health. So wanting to focus on health literacy, obviously the ability to obtain uh, this information was was critical, and the ability to deliver health literacy interventions was a challenge. And 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 there's no there was no doubt in my mind that the that the best place to begin with it was in that was in the K through 12 public school system. Uh, I I truly believe that that it's easier to build up a child than to repair an adult. Uh, and and the educational system is a major pathway for improving health literacy, uh, especially within underserved populations. And I know that the Department of Pediatrics has some wonderful programs uh, in the local school system, really addressing this problem in our local community. But this dearth of culturally tailored learning tools and programming uh, was one of the things that we picked up on very early on when looking at the school systems and the programs available, and one of the things that we wanted to address. And so we went with music, um, you know, not uh, music is an integral part of everyone's life. Um, what folks don't know that it occupies twice as much real estate in our brains than language itself. It increases blood flow to regions uh, that generate and control our emotions, the limbic system. It helps the brain process information more efficiently. It truly does enhance our memories and our retention. Just re you can remember things you were doing when certain songs were playing. You can remember the lyrics to so many songs that you loved as a child. You can still sing every word today. We all learned our ABCs through song. So music has very powerful effects on our memory and our retention, but it also augments learning. And, and it influences our affect to, to a degree that it can really influence behavior change. We're all familiar with its role in reducing our stress. And we know in my world that stroke patients who listen to music daily experience significantly greater gains in verbal memory and cognition only after two months compared to those who listen to audiobooks or those who didn't listen to either audiobook music or audiobooks on a daily basis. So music has this profound power. And we thought that we could leverage music within the health literary space as a superpower. And so I wanted to target for the reasons that I discussed at the bedside at Harlem, where I was seeing so many patients arriving beyond that treatment window, that three to four and a half hour, three at the time, four and a half hours now treatment window. We, I, I saw that as a potential 
uh, health literacy intervention for the Harlem community, perhaps we can increase health literacy and drive down those pre-hospital delays. And time is brain. You know, I'm sure many of you have been involved in activating the acute stroke page. Well, it's been actually quantified. 1.9 million neurons die every minute of a stroke. 14 billion synapses are doomed. 12 kilometers of myelinated fibers are destroyed with every minute of a stroke. This is why you see our residents charging around when that acute stroke page goes off. We can treat patients within four and a half hours, but the golden hour is that first hour. And the outcome from that first hour is really quite impressive uh, with intravenous thrombolysis. We can treat the large vessel occlusions out to six hours, and we can also treat a, sub, a super selected group of those large vessels, even out to 24 hours, using special multimodality imaging protocols. And so pre-hospital delays, I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, harper on this, but there's a lot of evidence that's been generated outside of my work and within my work that really shows that uh, it's driven largely by what we refer to as poor stroke preparedness, which is which is uh, encompasses stroke literacy. Uh, and so we truly believe that addressing stroke literacy, addressing uh, this issue, we hypothesized that could truly lead not only to increased stroke literacy and preparedness within these communities, but also drive down delays and increased thrombolysis. We define stroke literacy as the knowledge and ability to recognize stroke symptoms, that's the understanding component, knowledge of time dependent, the nature of acute stroke treatment, understanding that, uh, self-efficacy for engaging in that correct action, uh, and, the, and in responding to, to the symptoms appropriately by calling 911. We looked at adults in central, in central Harlem at the time. This is some work that Josh Wiley and, and Bernard Bowden, Bowden Albala did with me at the time. And we found really low uh, stroke literacy from our 10 community-based sites in central Harlem. We looked at children, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and we looked at stroke literacy among these children. And we found that they were actually lowest uh, in communities with the greater economic needs. So we, 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 we looked at, this was done within schools that, uh, and, and we looked at schools and their economic needs index uh, and, and, and school performance grades. And we found that stroke literacy was the lowest uh, in those environments relative to schools uh, that were, were performing well and had higher, very, very much lower uh, economic need. And that was about 2,900 kids. And so we wanted to develop a health literacy intervention. The question was, how do you do this? Uh, how do you do this in children? Um, and so we developed a multi-sensory, multi-level health education model. It was led uh, by um, one of my um, PhD uh, as a research scientist, uh, Dr. Evelina Swerad. And, and we developed this model and we published this model uh, to really show how we put this together. And it was really based on bringing art, culture, and science together within a transdisciplinary team. So we had our scientific folks, uh, which ranged from education professionals, teachers, communication experts, health disparities, public health professionals, physicians uh, um, who work within this space, uh, bringing them together with our kids of interest, uh, the kids from the communities that we were interested in working with. Uh, and then bringing that, bringing, bringing in artists and music producers and creatives onto this single team. I can tell you, I think we have videos of some of those interactions. Some of those meetings were just really off, really unbelievable meetings with the kids talking to the artists and the health professionals and the scientists, you know, contributing. It was just a wonderful process. Uh, and, and what came out of that, you'll see uh, as I, as I proceed in with this talk. But the liter health literacy intervention that we developed we also proceeded to test them first with efficacy trials uh, and, sec and after the efficacy trials with effectiveness trials, and then moving from hybrid implementation science um, uh, frameworks from hybrid one through hybrid, through hybrid threes uh, as part of our implementation process. And so we had a student advisory board. Uh, these were fifth graders from our champion schools uh, that took their board roles very, very seriously um, and um, some of the meetings that we recorded are really quite inspiring, actually. And they were responsible for guiding everything that we did. These kids were incredible. And every credit that I've gotten for this work needs to be given to these children who helped us build everything that we've accomplished. Um, when they said hip hop was the way to go, 
um, I was like, well, I'm a neurologist. I'm not a rapper, uh, but I love hip hop. Um, and um, and the question was, how do I even begin to meet to to address their demands for hip hop within health education? Uh, fortunately, a patient of mine, uh, this is, this is a, uh, maybe I'll tell this story later, connected me to Dougie Fresh, um, and I was able to convince Dougie to join me on this journey, uh, and he really brought. Um, the musical side and the hip hop side to the intervention. And it was through this collaboration between these children, between Dougie and his team, we were able to develop the hip hop stroke program. So I'll just show some of the, uh, the videos very quickly. Show. Now if he don't sound right, then he's doing the show. Uh -huh. Sway when he walks, then he's doing the show. Uh -huh. Slur when he's soft, then he's doing the show. Call 911, cause it ain't no choke. Now ask for the face, and ask for the arms. Ask for the speech, and ask for the time. Time to do what? Call 911. Time to do what? Call 911. Uh. For the face and hey. for the arm, uh -huh. for the speech and tears for the time. Time to do what? Call 911. And that's the way that the stroke is done. Come on. Everywhere I we have a Spanish version. Caminando como ciego. Ataque de cerebro. No pierdes tiempo. Ataque de cerebro. Rápido. Llama el nuevo uno uno. Era muy fea. Hasta los brazos. La lengua se derrama. Es tiempo. Tiempo de qué? Llama nuevo uno uno. Tiempo de qué? Llama nuevo uno uno. La cara me fea. Ah. Hasta los brazos. La lengua se derrama. Es tiempo. Tiempo de qué? Llama nuevo uno uno. El ataque de cerebro no es un güey. No. Yo digo latino. We also created videos to really show the show the child his or her potential role as being an agent for change when it comes to health behaviors within their communities. And this is one of those videos. This is day. So this is what he did. He listened to his kid. The moral of the story is you never too big. Face, arm, speech, and time is that sign to never ever cross the line now he stopped smoking and drinking and start thinking about the kind of food he was eating and it changed his life forever and him and his son sometimes exercise together sometimes kids see what you can't see sometimes kids see what you can't see sometimes kids see what you can't see and in this story the kid was me and um, the FAST mnemonic was upgraded to the BFAST mnemonic, and so we pr produced a BFAST mnemonic video. Let's see. I can share this. E for eyes, F for face, it don't matter what size. A for arm, S for speech, T for time. Four nine one one. Teach. B for balance, E for eyes, F for face, it don't matter what size. A for arm, S for speech, T for time. Four nine one one. Teach. I'm feeling a little off, feel a little dizzy, I'm feeling a little lost. I'm having trouble when I see the same thing that happened to you can happen to me. Face. Gets numb, gets weak, doesn't matter what size, start drooping in your cheek. Oh, kind of numb when you use it. Touch your arm, touch your leg, can't move it. Speech, speech when you're using your tongue. Time, Time to call 911. Sometimes we gotta panic and I kind of understand it. But you gotta call 911. See the moral of it all, you gotta make a call. If you see somebody looking real sick, be fast, be, fast. be, wise. be wise. Don't hesitate, you, you gotta, gotta move, move quick. quick. Come on, come on. Be uh -huh. E for eyes, okay. F for face, it don't matter what size. A for arm, S for speech, T for time. Four, nine, one, one. Teach. B for balance, uh -huh. E for eyes, okay. F for face, it don't matter what size. A for arm, uh -huh. S for speech, uh -huh. T for time. Four, nine, one, one. Teach. Teach. So these are some of the, this is actually one of my favorites. So they, they will also develop video games. And this is what we call the clock buster stroke hero video game. And the kids love it. You gotta clear out the artery, shoot the clots down. And, but the trick is when you run out of clock buster medicine, this is what happens. The kids don't like this part. You see the clock buster, they have to answer questions. And they have to learn the answers to these questions before they can move on. Um, and, um, and, and they just want to get on with the game, but, but they're passively learning 
about stroke symptoms, and all the answers are actually in the song, if you look at it. And then they get back to the game. And so um, we showed that, um, we showed that um, the knowledge that these kids were gaining, uh, first of all, we showed that the video game alone as a standalone item significantly increased kids' knowledge. Um, we showed that the musical cartoons as standalone items significantly increased the kids' knowledge and stroke literacy. And then we showed that that knowledge and that literacy were actually retained out to 18 months. And we were like, I mean, these kids, it was unbelievable. 18 months, um, we had stroke literate kids. Kids knew more about stroke than, believe me, a lot of um, of, of my health professional colleagues. Um, and, and they actually were the ones that came up with the name dry stroke for ischemic stroke and wet stroke for hemorrhagic stroke, which we actually incorporated. And that was our student advisory board that came up with that, which we incorporated into our programming. So we, we realized that these kids were so powerful that they could really, we hypothesized that they could really transfer that information to their parents and their grandparents. And we could see from the early chart that I showed how stroke risk and stroke disparities are so high among those young age groups, the age between 35 and 45. And these are often parents who have kids in elementary and middle schools and, and could be reached this high risk group through their children. That's what we hypothesized. And we also found that about 15 to 20 percent of, of kids were being directly raised by their grandparents who were also at risk for stroke. And so we hypothesized and we created this model that we could leverage children and, and utilize their stroke literacy to improve the stroke literacy of their parents and grandparents. And we hypothesized and tested that hypothesis. We created a uh, um, we created a, um, a, a, uh, a framework for measuring the transfer of that knowledge. It was a composite score that involved watching the cartoon with the parent, wrapping the fast symptoms to the parents, reading the comic book to the parents, and filling out the crossword puzzle with the parents, um, and then completing these activities with, with their parents at home. Um, and then we created a, a, a composite score of these activities, and we found that that, and, and I'll show the data, that these children were just incredible. Um, the child-mediated communication we published, incredibly positive results. Um, uh, and when you measure literacy at baseline um, on these parents, and you look at it um, after we intervene on their children, uh, that their, their stroke literacy really shot up, both for the parents and grandparents on follow-up. Um, I just want to go back here and show um these kids i learned about fast right and it can save someone's life f me or i'm um, safe when your face drips down a me or when your arm drips down f me speech when your speech gets blurry can't really understand it and t is time time to call 911 and and um this is what the program looks like so we have two models the one model is 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 a classroom is a ed, auditorium style model and the other is a classroom model so this is the auditorium style model. to be exact this is not fiction this is all facts when i say brain you say attack brain attack brain attack Boom. and then we have a classroom model this is a fully digitized program and this is what we scaled globally Teachers love it because they can just just hang out, and and the kids. I mean, it's unbelievable that they're actually learning and having so much fun doing it. But uh, we also had to create a scale for measuring stroke literacy in children, which didn't exist. And and uh, one of my research um, um, staff, she's now running the uh, uh, SOFI, um, the Society for Public Health um, Educators. Um, she really helped develop this, what we call a SLAM, Slope Literacy Action Measure for children and validated it in our children here in, in New York City public school system. And this is the instrument that, was, that we used in our studies. And I go back to um, the fear I had in, 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 in really doing this type of work, um, the fear of pursuing a first R01. I'll talk about some of those fears earlier, uh, but I did go for it. Um, and I 
I, I, I believe that all the activities that were happening around the NIH, uh, they were actually interested in these types of applications and it was a perfect storm. Um, and as an early investigator, uh, I was able to get, um, to get my first R01. Uh, this was back in 2009. We randomized, um, we randomized uh, about 3,000 plus children, fourth to sixth graders, and about 1,100 of their parents into the hip-hop stroke intervention versus an attentional control. Um, we define stroke literacy, as I've already, managed, the goal I've, already, I've already mentioned. We know that these children, uh, these ch we know that children in the home are often the people present at the onset of a stroke. Um, if you look at the chart on the left, um, and, and so we really hypothesized by, by targeting these children, working with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, where a lot of our pilot work was done, we could really raise the stroke literacy of their parents and their grandparents. So just to move quickly through this, our trial was strongly positive. Um, for every parent whose child was exposed to the intervention, uh, for every parent, 100 parents, parents exposed to the intervention, 20 had perfect stroke literary scores. And that's the, using a binary outcome, not a continuous. Uh, and um, they're just, the children were unbelievable. Their self-efficacy for calling 911, for describing a stroke event to the, to the operator, for teaching the parent about stroke, unbelievable. We also found a quadrupling of our thrombolysis rates using a quasi-experimental design uh, at Harlem hospital. This is one of the kids who saved a life. I wake up to go and use the bathroom to pee, and I find myself next to the bathtub. I feel that little electricity coming down, and everything stopped. I was worried. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Then I remembered what um, the hip hop stroke told me, and then I did it. How, if you see someone that has blurry vision and their arm gets weak and they have a really bad headache, call 911. Daniel, I think because of his knowledge, he knew what, you know, what the right step to, to do, you know, call 911. I probably would be more panicky, but they gave me strength from how they behave and how they spoke to um, the um, 911 operator. You know, it gives you a second chance in life because I probably would have lost him. So we have children all over the world doing this now um, with a simple intervention. It has powerful, powerful effects. We scaled it uh, across New York, uh, New York State, working in partnership with the DOH. Uh, we now have 42 stroke center hospitals uh, utilizing the hip hop stroke intervention and 42 out of the total 120 stroke center hospitals in, in this state, um, which is which is wonderful. Uh, we were able to change policy around stroke center. Pu stroke center accreditation requires a public education component. We were able to work with the state to change their policy around that public education engagement to include meaningful measures uh, of efficacy of those activities and not just a checkbox. We were also we also showed that our intervention had impact across multiple levels of the socio-ecological model. We scaled to over 20 cities. Uh, it's been it's been replicated in multiple countries, um, and um, we have uh, one of our ambassadors from Nashville would be on later, I believe, talking about his experience uh, with the program in Nashville. So we moved on to new do domains. I'm gonna wind up, just talk briefly about some of the other work that we've been doing. We took the hip hop stroke model. We realized that this isn't about stroke. This is a model that we could use for a whole variety of conditions. Uh, we've done the similar thing with food choice behavior, food purchasing behavior. Um, and um, we've, we've actually just concluded a randomized trial uh, on uh, food purchasing behavior. We took hip hop and we took math. We created a hybrid hip hop math curriculum based on um, and where we integrated all the common cores of math standards for fourth and fifth grade. Um, and then we built a hip hop curriculum around that and we, we rolled it out 
Um, some of our pilot work was very encouraging. We used the traffic-like model uh, for nu nutrient density for foods, and we could see a baseline versus post-intervention a few weeks out. Uh, we took, we're took we looking at this now at, at 12 months out. Uh, it's a menu board literacy focused intervention. Uh, this is a, some quick video of that. The menu. What about the calories? Depending on the venue, you can check the column, top or the bottom. Maybe on the right side. Sound like a problem. Context too, yeah, it tells about the ranges. So that one really just to teaches kids how to utilize those, those menu postings uh, in restaurants. This is a, a very embarrassing video, but I will show it. The next one, I'm gonna go for it. Oh, maybe something, someone doesn't want me to show it, but I'm gonna be stubborn and I'm gonna show this very embarrassing video. I can do it, you can do it, he can do it, she can do it, we can do it if we just make sure that we care more for our health. I said it's cool to be healthy. Yes. Some think it's cool by the way that they dress. Not so cool. Cool could be getting your education in school. Now I'm cool. Woo. Can you eat go with the slow? Yes. yes. What about go with the whoa? Yes. 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 We're not saying you can't eat whole foods. Just watch how much whoa foods you eat. Go all day, slow sometimes. Oh. I'm about to lose my mind. Some say healthy food hard to find. Not true. What you do is just read between the lines. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I say you do better if you knew better. Now that you know what you choose better. They say healthy equals wealth. No matter what you do, you just do it for yourself. So I won't show that ever again, I promise. So this is some work that Dr. James Noble, we've taken it into the dementia space as well. Um, and I'll just show a quick video. He's just concluded a randomized trial uh, on his dementia literacy program. Is the app, which is both forget. I got two grandmas who might need to get checked. Uh, the first one she forgets sometimes, but my other grandmas, why I wrote this rhyme? Sometimes I forget, but I don't stress. I'm a good does too, and that's a show bet. But I need a help, she forgets all the time. Dates, names, and faces, that's all time a sign. L is for losing, might be bad news. When you can't find your keys, your phone, your bag too, it ain't cool. But we can shake it off and smile, cause it only happens once in a while. I'm a good style. Seems like I need a losing everything her glasses and purse even her wedding ring she's lost her way and lost interest to in things that she would always do yo that's dementia clues it's true and jamie uh will have some interesting results coming out again a strongly positive trial um it has real safety implications for uh, uh children who are living with grandparents with the disease um, and it's highly under-recognized and highly stigmatized in, in, in our communities. Uh, and and this, this intervention is really a wonderful intervention. Um, we've taken that to countries. This is uh, um, the work that we're doing in Nigeria, in Lagos. And those are the public schools that we've enrolled in Lagos. You can see some of the children uh, with their old school hip hop materials. So hip hop public health was born out of a lot of this work. Um, we've had a lot of success in the academic field, and we felt, you know, we should be doing this um, in the nonprofit world so that we can truly scale it um, without any of the bureaucracy and the Columbia challenges uh, that we, we, we you would imagine with this type of work. So we've created a number of, uh, of programs and, and interventions. Um, all our interventions are free. We raise the funds. We work with our artists and our children. We create the resources. We show efficacy around the resources. Uh, we also build health educator toolkits uh, for those who want to use these resources. We have a health MC program that anyone can sign up for that gives you free access to all the teaching materials, all the lesson plans, um, and, um, and you get training support from the organization during implementation. This is um, some work that we did around salt literacy. We actually, um, one of our artists, Salt and Pepper, Salt from Salt and Pepper, was involved in this. Well, let's 
talk about salt and how you gotta leave it alone just hear me out we need you around for a while the focus here is hypertension prevention so pay attention now we can find salt in potato chips sandwiches rolls many don't know what's even in your cereal to sell it like it is and how it could be 1500 milligrams is what it should be a slice of pizza that's almost halfway there pick up the menu press pause and have a salad instead is that saltless nope but it's better <laughs> and you can have a whole lot of salt baby let's talk about We've done some work around sugar too. I mean, if you do salt, you got to do sugar. So this is a uh, run. This is from DMC from Run DMC. Oh, no sound. So this one actually won a Grand Prix at the Cannes Film Festival, um, and um, we have an app that goes with this one, um, and kids can identify hidden sugars by just pointing the app at the food package. Um, and I really wish you could, but you'll have to go to the site and, and watch this video. Um, we also, we, we mobilized during the pandemic and we realized that we could bring COVID vaccine literacy to these communities in a creative way. Uh, we created a whole program around vaccine literacy with videos in both English and Spanish addressing uh, how they work, um, how safe they are, uh, and misconceptions, et cetera. This is some of that work. I got the vaccine, you got the vaccine, they got the vaccine, we got the vaccine. We can get back to normal, let me inform you, let's all get the vaccine. It's about community immunity. This is another embarrassing one. For you and me. If Doc says it's good, trust me, it's good. Now let's all get the vaccine. Doc. What to do, Dr. Mo? It's a SOS. We gotta let the folks know. They believe that the vaccine is bad for you. But we looked at the data and it just ain't true. When I got the shot, it kind of felt like the flu. Shoot, that's much better than the ICU. The shot's pretty safe, but the Rona is cruel. It could make you sick, could be the end of you. It's vaccine or bust, but there's a lot of mistrust. Cause the system is racist, that's the main basis. But face it, the numbers don't lie. We gotta survive and save black and brown lives. We need community immunity to fight from within we need eight out of ten to get it in for the win to protect and defend and hug your mom again cover your grin let the healing begin uh. this is a this is a spanish uh we had a whole series in spanish as well this is just one of them <laughs> So I'm not the only one who's going to be embarrassed because Anna Sapin, Sapin who's a OBGYN here, actually rapped on one of these, believe it or not. We got Anna into the studio, so, and she's got some skills too, so. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just move to the last one. There's an HIV one here, but I'll skip that for now for the sake of time, and I'll just end with, um, this is the HIV one, but I'll skip that. I'll just end with this one for the sake of time. Um, this is one we did about brushing your teeth. First off, wash your hands for 20 seconds or more. This is a brush along, do it to the song. Doc said at least two minutes long. Two times every day, now you're never wrong. Brush in every way, now the plaque's gone. Inside and outside, the top side. Bottom, just let your brush glide. Doc told me how, never rinse your mouth. Let the paste do its thing, then you spit it out. Here's one little thing, can't forget about. Never go to sleep with the meal in your when mouth. You smile, She's 12 years old, the singer. That's right, that's right.
So thank you guys so much. Um, I just wanna, just for the residents, I just wanna say that this whole work began at the bedside with a concern. Um, the concern became a research question, which became a first R01. The first R01 opened the doors to multiple R01s and center grants. And the research portfolio translated into a nonprofit with societal and global impact. And it also taught me rapping. So I have a huge team. Um, none of this would have been possible without the huge team here at Columbia. Uh, John Rauch, who's a member of the Department of Pediatrics. Rachel Shelton, a public health uh, implementation science. Terrific data coordinating team. Terrific team at uh, public health. I have a board of artists with Dougie Fresh, Chuck D from Public Enemy, DMC, Ashanti, and Salt, um, and all the other artists that we've worked with, ranging from Ariana Grande to Jordan Sparks. They were tremendous in their support of this. The research and outreach staff um, that have really been just incredible. And, and I put a photo from our folks in the Hawaii program. Um, and so thank you so much uh, for your time today. We just wanted to say thank you so much for your inspiring talk this morning. It's so important to acknowledge social determinants of health, such as health, health, health literacy. And I think we are all very impressed by the work that you've done to address it. And some of those songs may end up on my personal playlist in the future. <laughs> I also do not think you should be embarrassed. You are quite talented. <laughs> you should tell that to my kids. <laughs> I know that we have a lot of questions from the room and we also have some questions from Zoom. I do want to say that there will be a session from 9.30 to 10.30 for further questions. We may be able to take a few right now, but I think we might be able to do like two or three. And I know there were lots of eager people in the front. <laughs> Gita, um, that was just so inspiring and a lot of fun. And I just want to thank you um, for coming and, and sharing that with us. You're, um, the fact that you're, you, you, you've shown that you're kind of a treasure, but you're Columbia's treasure and New York Presbyterian's treasure and just really appreciate that. And thank you for doing that. I have a specific question. You know, one of, um, one of my recent heroes um, is Bryce Love. So Bryce Love uh, um, was the best running back in the country in like 2018, went to my alma mater. Um, my daughter was friends with him, so I knew he was as good a person um, kind of as he played on TV as um, this running back. And he was a, a Heisman Trophy finalist. And the most inspiring thing to me about him was that in interviews, he wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, and he didn't talk about the NFL. Um, the reason he wanted to be a pediatrician was because uh, he had been sick as a kid and was treated by somebody who inspired him. And um, as you know, uh, kind of the unicorn in medicine is black male pediatricians. And he was inspired in that way. And as I was watching your presentation, this is it looked wonderful for you know stroke intervention and all the things you pointed out but you know perhaps more powerful than football is hip hop and engaging kids to be part of that um is uh really powerful as a pipeline towards healthcare profession um my specific question is are is are you guys tracking that and looking at at what the impact of your education programs on for those children and what they subsequently decide to do with their lives? That's a great question, Steve. Thank you for that. Um, and um, yes, we actually most recently um, are going back to our, our original cohort from 2010. It's a Where Are They Now uh, uh, program that we, we've just launched. Um, and these, are, I mean, we have, we have about probably probably at least 5,000 kids that we are tracking in that 
uh, in that um, in this new study. Uh, and so we'll we'll have much more information on that. But anecdotally, and the, one of the reasons why we decided to do this is because I was giving a talk at Abercrombie's, um, um, which is a is a huge um, um, annual conference for uh, um, students, college students uh, who are interested in STEM and 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 healthcare, um, and. And I was given the keynote um, a few years ago. And after my keynote, um, two, um, two of the college grads, college participants came to me afterwards and, and they were fifth graders at PS, I think it was the one right behind on 135th and, and, um, and Fifth Avenue. Um, they were fifth graders there. And now they were going to medical school. And they talked to me afterwards about how the program in their schools influenced their career trajectory and was one of the reasons why they got excited about, about science and pursuing uh, and going into medical school. Another serendipitous experience, which is why we're tracking this formally now, was I found out after I hired one of my RAs that she was a fifth grade student in one of my schools you know, 10 years, I'm like, why didn't you tell me before I interviewed you? She goes, I didn't want to bias the interview. I said, damn right, you should have biased the interview. And uh, and she's now working, she's actually uh, working at my community health worker center in Manhattanville, and she's running that program. And so these anecdotal reports, um, I was giving another talk in Westchester and one of the, one of the, um, one of the people organizing it said the same thing. Uh, and so I've been, and so we decided to formally track this because I really think that getting these types of programs into schools is not just a health or an academic benefit, it's also a career life benefit. So thank you for that. Dr. Williams, at the beginning, you talked about the disparate acceptances of uh, research grants at the NIH. How does the NIH know the race or ethnicity of the applicants? We mark it on the application. Is that required? I mean, or maybe it shouldn't be? Well, that's a great question, but it was required. Um, I actually submitted one. I'm submitting one today, so I'll, I'll take a look to see. I'm, I'm putting it in R34 today, so I'll take a look to see if it's still required. But it was always required uh, with NIH grants. Dr. Williams, can I get the next question? I'm Stephanie lubinsky Dazir. I'm the chief of our pediatric pulmonary division, and I am blown away. That was incredible. Um, and I appreciate the comments about your journey as someone who is really struggling in the trenches as a Black physician scientist in the K to R transition. So thank you for amplifying that really hard journey that you've taken. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your experience in providing content for these videos and, and working with the artists, as well as how do you get funders like the National Institute of Health to fund you know, rap artists? <laughs> and I can imagine that was very, very complex. And maybe if you can give us a tiny snapshot about that experience. And then I have a future collaboration on climate justice that I'd oh, love nice, to talk nice. to you about later. So um, I think we'll probably get into this more afterwards, but but the um, the short answer is um, is the bigger the dream, the harder the grind. That's the short answer. There were a lot of no's on my journey. There are a lot of it's impossible. You can't on my journey. You got to stay true to who you are, and you have to follow your passion, and you have to fight for your dreams and fighting is not easy especially when you're a person of color it's exhausting you wake up wanting to give up every single day and i still do today but you just gotta keep fighting thank you i'm just gonna share the two questions that we have over zoom and then we will save all of the other in-person questions for afterwards just for the sake of time so from dr tarif chowdhury Thanks for sharing the power of hip hop improving stroke literacy in children in underserved communities. How do the children in better served slash white communities have better stroke health, stroke health literacy? Is it just a matter of better health literacy overall? If so, is the better health literacy a matter of greater amounts of healthcare access or greater quality healthcare access? It's a lot, of, lot to unpack in that question. 
but i'll we'll start with back. the i'll start with the first part of it uh which is you know our we have about 42 hospitals who are using this program across new york state and many of those hospitals are serving white communities in fact some of these cities up north i'm like you guys are using this uh, unbelievable and the data is just as strong from those children from those communities so i think hip hop as we know cuts across all racial ethnic geographical barriers it's a universally it's the number one genre in on the planet right now so it benefits everybody and even though we designed this in terms of the qualitative work we did in developing these tools um it's it's we finding that it can be used by almost any community we i had to go to the czech republic once because they wanted to want over to translate our tools into czech for the folks out there so it's been used all over and so that's the answer to the first question the second question is around content i believe so content is really you know we we have a model that we use to develop the content and the model really involves working very closely with our student advisory board this content was developed in partnership with our student advisor where we bring the the concepts and they help to translate those concepts into content and then also the artists play a huge role in in remember a lot of these artists come from the streets a lot of these artists you know they come from these communities and they know how to relate to children and they working with that co content uh, it's a really beautiful partnership approach to developing every track that we create um you'll meet Artie Green who's one of our producers later and he'll talk a little bit about um, his role in developing a lot of this content. Artie produced probably 80% of our work, our early work, um, and, and he's just phenomenal. He used to produce for a lot of, for Murder, Inc. Uh, she did a lot of work with Ja Rule and Ashanti back in the days. Thank you so much. And the last question for now, uh, for Dr. Sushil Katarpal, he's one of our PGY2 residents. Incredible intervention. Curious to see if there are plans to share these videos across social media platforms to reach a wider range of children in the current generation who are routinely on YouTube slash TikTok, et cetera. It's a great question. So during COVID, actually, all our videos were one minute. Every video was one minute long, and for, for specifically for those social media platforms, so they could be shared. And they were widely shared during that time. So yes, we do create these social media bites of our content for dissemination. Is there a social media handle we can follow? HHPH, it's on the slice, that slide, HHPH.org. Yes, right Perfect. There. Thank you. Thank you.